You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. And we're joined today by retired supervisory special agent, James R. Fitzgerald, a.k.a. Fitz. Fitz, how are you doing today? I am doing great, Bill and Kristen. Always good to be back on MOM, mom for short, (laughs) mind over murder. You know, me with my acronyms and language things. So no, it's great to be back with you guys. It's been a little bit of a a time span, but, um, but thanks for having me on. Well, we were just discussing the fact that you're relaxing at the Jersey Shore, enjoying the first spectacular weather of the season. At least the first few days in a row. There have been some nice days before, but yeah, the first uh, few days here, I'm uh, running a bunch of errands today, doing outdoor work. So yeah, it's nice watching the boats come out, the sailboats. So uh, while well, I'm doing my errands, so it's a good, uh, good feeling. Thanks for hanging out with us and for letting us call you Fitz. Oh, I've been called much worse. And if I volunteer that <laughs> nickname right away... That tends to make things uh, a little easier. So uh, it's nice to have a built-in nickname since my youth. I was never freckles or lefty or punchy <laughs> or names like, because when I grew up, and Bill, you're around my age, Yes, a lot of kids had nicknames. Oh, yeah. It doesn't seem to be as pop. It's not politically correct, I guess, to give kids nicknames now. But, uh, but just about every kid in my neighborhood had a nickname. I was pretty good at putting them out there, too. And some of them were kids. less than flattering, too. My favorite one was bus driver. That was a nickname for a kid Why? because the rumor was he failed school so many times. Remember what that means? Mm-hmm. You could actually fail a class uh, and you have to stay over the next year. He failed so many times that in eighth grade, he could, he could drive the bus to school. So his <laughs> nickname was bus driver. That's bad. I'm sorry. And then there yeah, would be names like, mind. you know, pudgy and, you know, there were oh, yeah. for a while there, my dad was a naval officer sailors, you know, guys I would see on my dad's ship, they always wanted to call me Red because I was a total carrot top. I know it's hard to believe now, but back then, I, you know, we, we had bright red hair and the, the, they always wanted to call me Red, which I absolutely hated and would not respond to. <laughs> Later on, I remember an eighth grade teacher telling me that women would pay hundreds of dollars to have hair that color. And again, I didn't really want to be picked out of the crowd for that. Well, and Kristen's hair is red, but I'm not sure that's... Ish, not ne- sort of. Kind not of. necessarily the color you were born with, but very flattering. <laughs> I wasn't even going to go there, but uh, it's nice <laughs> hair regardless, Kristen. And so is your bills, for that matter. For people who don't know, we can see each other right now, even though I guess the listeners just have it uh, by audio, no, no video. Well, and it's funny, I'm anticipating from the look I just got that I may be editing this part of the podcast out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, thanks for making the crack about my hair there, bud, but that's oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, <clears throat> no one will ever hear this part. Oh, well, Fitz, we're so glad to have you with us. And you have a brand new project called The Fitz Files that we would love to hear about. So go ahead and tell us a little bit about The Fitz Files. Well, uh, full disclosure, you play a little bit of a role in uh, episode nine. So we are episode eight, actually talk about that. All right. I want to hear about this. Yeah. But bottom line is ever since the full title is the Fitz Files Manhunt Unabomber. Ever since the show premiered Manhunt Unabomber back in uh, August of 2017, I've been inundated with emails and and tweets and and other kinds of messages from around the world about, you know, uh, this. how did this happen and why did this happen and where did this take place as opposed to here, whatever. So many questions from PhDs to media people to eighth graders, you name it. And I finally said, you know what, I would answer most of them, try to be polite. I say, hey, read my book, the third book, A Journey to the Center of the Mind. And I said, maybe it's a good idea to finally put something together here, a a series of my own. I started calling it a podcast first, but we decided to make it an audio book. 
So what we did is I have a, an eight episode audio book, The Fitz Files, which corresponds with each of the eight episodes of Manhunt Unabomber. There's a prologue, there's an epilogue explaining some things. But once we get into the episodes, the first uh, 20 to 25 minutes is the five facts versus fiction from <laughs> Fitz, in which I go over each episode and say what really happened, what didn't happen, and maybe why the writers chose to do it that way. And then in the second half of each episode is an interview with a person who was responsible for the show one way or the other. So episode one is our good friend, Jim Clemente. Yeah. Uh, episode two is our uh, uh, my good friend, uh, the director, uh, Greg Utanis. He directed all eight episodes of Manhunt Unabomber. My other friend is Andrew, who was the head writer of uh, Manhunt Unabomber, uh, the series itself. And then we have set directors, art directors. We actually have the questions that Sam Worthington asked me by email. He couldn't make it onto the, to the audio book. But we brought in a genuine Australian friend of mine named Jenny, and she reads his questions and I answer them. And then for the very last episode, and this is where uh, this is where Kristen comes in, is that I opened up by on uh, social media. Anybody had a good question for me about Manhunt Unabomber, submit it. And if it hasn't been answered already in the audio book, which in a way wasn't fair because people didn't know what was going to be covered mm -hmm. in the audio book. But I said, keep asking questions. And Kristen, you submitted a few of them. And finally I said, hey, that one's not covered. That's one of them. So uh, I didn't play any favor. It's just because you had me on your show. It wasn't necessarily that I would bring you on mine, but you had a very legitimate question. And I did my best to answer it in, uh, in episode uh, eight. And uh, the epilogue just kind of signed off there, paid a little tribute to the victims. We never can forget the victims. And Bill, mm -hmm. I know you know that all too well in your, in your personal life. I did, uh, you know, mention the people killed by the Unabomber, uh, as well as referenced uh, the people injured. And then, um, you know, thanked a few people and then took it from there. So if you like Manhunt Unabomber and you're any interested in true crime at all, and or interested in the arts, you will like this audio book. It's available on Amazon. You can go right to my website, jamesrfitzgerald.com, order it directly through there. And uh, it was a fun project to do. It was fun interviewing. I've been interviewed probably 200 times, like I am right now, by you guys uh, for other people's podcasts or audiobooks. But for once, I was the one in charge. And it was kind of fun, like back in the old days. Just the facts, lady. Just the facts. And, uh, and get the information from them. I didn't really do that in my audiobook. But it was just fun. Uh, and it's really interesting hearing the director and, and, and his point of view, how he even got into directing, the head writer, how he even got into writing. And it's almost an accident that he was even brought on board for this project. And, and it was a little bit of an anxiety issue because Jim Clemente was going to be the head writer or one of them, but then Discovery didn't bring him on board after mm. he co created So you're going to hear, like they say about laws and sausages, you really don't want to know how they're made. <laughs> well, you listen to episode one with Jim Clemente, and you'll see how this whole thing turned into a bizarre scenario in which... Uh, I actually returned some money that they gave me and from a contractual perspective. We explain all that in the mini series. So if you like true crime, you'll like the Fitz files. If you're into the art, want to be a director, a writer, an actor, you'll like it too. I would suggest check it out. And uh, I, I think you'll enjoy it. So it sounds like this was a project that was maybe born of necessity um, <laughs> because you, you said you were getting so many emails. Had you been planning something along those lines for a while and it just became really necessary to do after you started getting inundated on social media? This was an idea somehow down the line to do something like this with just going on a few different podcasts as I am now. But it really hit me uh, on the beach uh, last Labor Day weekend thinking, you know what, with the 25th anniversary, and that was really the key with the 25th anniversary of the arrest of Ted Kaczynski coming up. It's now in the past. It was April 3rd. I said, boy, it'd be nice to do something and get it out there just in time for this and, and really uh, answer all these questions once and for all. I've always been a film buff as a kid and TV buff, and I would go to movies and watch them. If, if it was based on a true story, I'd want to go and buy the book afterwards. And I, and I learned as a young kid that what you see on the screen, be it the big screen in the movie theater or the TV screen, it's not always exactly what happened in, uh, in real life. And that certainly was the case with Manhunt Unabomber. 
It's actually an audio book, as you hear in it. There were some arguments I had with the director and the head writer and even Mr. Goldwyn, who's the grandson of Samuel Goldwyn of MGM. And, you know, I remember hanging the phone up on them once. I was angry because they did <laughs> they did push some things that I didn't really want to happen in, in the series. And there's like one or two retired FBI agents on this list. And these guys, they just don't understand the, the, the complexity of, of the entertainment world. And I, I'm, I, I, you know, I, I wonder about some of their cases they worked back in the day, too, with some of these attitudes. But they somehow think this was a documentary. And, you know, yeah. Fitz did this, Fitz did that. No, Fitz was a composite character. He was an amalgam, whatever you want to call it. And not every single scene is meant to represent a literal you know, scenario that played out in real life. Right. And, and the director and the writer goes through why they did that, how they did that, the reasons involved. And, 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 and if you listen to my audio book, you'll understand how that all plays out. And I finally understood that down the line. And I correct anybody right up front who says, oh, I saw your docu- documentary fits. I said, well, I hope, you know, that's great, but it's actually a scripted series. There's a difference. And of course, documentaries can be tilted too. They can be slanted mm-hmm. with someone's sure. agenda. They can put in what they want or don't want. Um, but, but, you know, Hollywood productions do too. So um, uh, like this one. And uh, so that's those, those few um, people who don't really think very clearly didn't really bother me, but it's the honest questions from the, from the younger people, whatever. I said, you know what, let me put something out there that really explains how this process works from beginning to end. I remember I was retired my first week. Jim Clemente was still in the bureau. He had about two years ago. He comes over my house during lunch. I'm retired. It was strange. And, oh, I miss being in the office today, but he said, well, that's okay, but we got to start working on this Unabomb movie. And back then in the early days, it was, it was supposed to be a movie that we were putting together. But we realized very early on that no movie could capture the intricacies and the length of time involved in this actual real 17-year-long case. But we realized that may be the best thing to do until early 2014, when HBO premiered the show, the series True Detective. And that sort of changed the landscape in Hollywood. And then Netflix came along and of course Amazon and they wanted these types of series. And so we hit, you know, we hit it at the perfect time, as you'll hear again in mostly episode one with Jim, and how he finally Discovery was looking to expand, Discovery Channel was looking to expand their horizons and do some scripted series. And they loved this one and they spent money. They got some A-lister actors and they, you know, they spared no expense for, uh, you know, uh, you know, effects and, 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 and cinematography and all that stuff. I was really glad how they did it. And I'm proud of it in the long run. It tells a good story about the mm-hmm. FBI. Yeah, sometimes we argued. Sometimes we didn't agree on things. Um, it wasn't quite as bad as the antipathy that is shown or the acrimony in the uh, in the series. I basically got along with my Unabomb task force bosses. But there were some disagreements we had. And there's at least one guy that thought all along that the Unabomber was not Ted Kaczynski. And he would argue with me. You're wrong about this. You're wrong about this. And he was one of the top guys on the management team there. Finally, he kind of came over afterwards when all the evidence was found inside Kaczynski's cabin. Well, Fitz, looks like you were right all along. Oh, he did actually say that. The truth is the facts bore your theory out in terms of the kind of person and then the person you were looking for. But is it, did it feel good for this guy to say to you, you know something, you were right? I can't tell you how he felt, but, um, and I always want to say too, it was a team effort. I, I was put in charge of the language analysis in that case. I was a profiler. I'd never done anything like this before. I had a master's in psychology, but I hadn't taken one course in linguistics at the time. I never thought I would. Um, I figured I'm done my, you know, I have a graduate degree. I'm good to go. But I realized a few years later after Unibah, hey, I'm kind of good at this. It kind of worked out well for me, but let me uh, let me get that other degree to really uh, take it to the next level. So I guess it felt good for him to say that. I mean, he, you know, he contributed to the investigation too, but a lot of people were skeptical about the value of language as evidence. And as the miniseries reflects, my book reflects, it wasn't really until that linguistic smoking gun of you can't eat your cake and have it too, which we knew was in the manifesto, paragraph 185, but it wasn't until I found it in document T-137, uh, an early letter to the editor of a magazine that Ted Kaczynski wrote, that we really felt we had something because that was such a highly idiosyncratic phraseology where the two verbs are transposed. And uh, that really took it to the next level. That's what got us the search warrant in the cabin and the rest, as we know, uh, is history. 
it's kind of a malapropism, is it? Is it not? Because isn't it reversed the way well, he yes, phrases it? Well, yes, you're you're right. The this is where it gets a little complicated. In that, by today's standards, and since really the beginning of the 19th century, people have been saying you can't have your cake and eat it too. There's an old Bob Dylan song, uh, "Lay Lady Lay." That term mm-hmm. is excused mm-hmm. uh, is, is used. There's a a, a Four Seasons song in which that uh, phraseology is used. Interestingly, and it's almost like Kaczynski knew this, in, um, in early modern English, 1500s England, give or take, when it was, that expression was first used, it was you can't eat your cake and have it too, which actually makes sense when you it think does about make it. Sense. Oh, it does, yeah. actually. The way we it say does. it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And Kaczynski <laughs> being the wordsmith and no doubt the genius that he was and is, he, he flipped it around on his own. Unfortunately for him... That was, um, you know, that was the uh, indicator that basically wound up uh, signing the search warrant to get inside his cabin. So his perfection actually came back to uh, cost him in the long run. Oh, I wanted to steer back to something you said a minute ago, Fitz. The complaint that some people had about the Manhunt Unabomber series was that in the simplification of the storytelling, the Fitz character ends up being involved in different aspects of the case when the truth is, I'm going to make up a number here. That might have been 30 or 50 additional people. Is that what you're saying that happens in the script writing process? Yes. And as you know, I can tell by the intonation of your question, Bill, it's sort of a superfluous superfluous issue. You can't put a movie or even a miniseries together with that many characters. You have to combine them. People would lose track of who's doing what, Mm -hmm. different actors, the cost would overrun, all those type things. So uh, the only, the only, the the one big, um, the biggest piece of fiction in, in the series is the time with Fitz and Kaczynski sitting across a table from one another. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen. And I've said that from day one, when I finally agreed, well, I really had no choice, but when I finally agreed that those scenes, all right, fine, they're going to be in the series. I said, here's the only thing though. You want me to promote this thing? It's in my contract. I really had no choice. Go on TV, (laughs) go on podcast, whatever. I'm not going to lie then. Fitz, we don't expect you to. You tell it like it is. We'll handle the creative license and, and literary license and all that stuff. So the biggest issue is Fitzgerald never, you know, two guys, Fitzgerald never interviewed the Unabomber. How dare he? I never said or wrote anywhere that I did. And that wasn't the reason I did my audio book, you know, and any of this kind of a complaint. Anybody who's like over 15 years of age know that's what Hollywood does. You know, they, they make the most succinct and cogent story. The plot line has to flow along. And really, Andrew Sadrowski the head writer, he explains it so well when he gets into this and how, how this decision was made. And he knew I'd be a little upset about that. And even the director said, yeah, you know, Fitz, I've never, I've never he's done a lot. He's won Emmys for, I think, uh, the show House and, and a number of other uh, projects he, he was on. He said, Fitz, you know, we never handled an actual living person who was a protagonist in one of our shows or series or whatever, and a good guy like you, not someone in prison. And we really felt that must have been awkward. And I think we could have done some things different with you if we were going to do this over again. And if I ever do this again, we would have you more involved in the everyday you know, project as it goes along. Because mm-hmm. they waited till all the scripts were written. I remember it was like November of, uh, was it 15 or 16? I think 16. They finally called me, hey, uh, we sent you those emails last night. What do you think? And I said, I hope these are dream sequences, right? Because you actually have Fitz doing this with Kaczynski. And well, no, we don't do dreams in this. You know, I, that was when the hang up call came. And then I returned some money to them because they kind of screwed my friend Jim Clemente and, and, uh, and his co-creator, Tony. They had to take it to arbitration to get it figured out. All these details are in, uh, in episode one, the second part of it. But then we get into the more fun parts of the uh, series. And even the guys like the set decorator, and an and assistant property manager. These are really interesting guys when they have to uh, do a, a series or a show that's 20 years in the past. They said doing a show 100 years in the past is easier to do for props and artifacts of those ages than it is only 20 years ago, uh, about 25 years ago now, because people aren't saving. It's, it's, it's like junk around the house now you want to get rid of. So they get rid of all these old phones, these old computer screens, fax oh, machines. Right. Yeah. But a hundred years ago, they can come up with stuff, and even if they design it themselves or make it. So it's interesting hearing them explain the difficulty, and they go into detail in really a fun way of how they came up with some of the some of the props on the series. 
So as you had mentioned earlier, I am briefly featured in episode eight on the Fitz Files. And actually what I wanted to do is ask the question to you now that I ask you on the Fitz Files, if that's okay. And I'll give the answer for free today. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So the question was, how would you say the Unabomber case has shaped your career as a profiler and how has it changed the way you profile? Yes. And um, again, we took eight sort of fan questions uh, from eight different people. And with with a few people, we had to go bounce back and forth. Ah, you're onto something here, but that's already been uh, covered. So so yours was a very good question that I really didn't get into in the audio book. And that's why I decided to answer it. And the answer, as I said then, and I'll, I'll sort of summarize it here, but definitely being enmeshed directly in an investigation uh, at the tail end of it was very interesting when there were already like half a dozen profiles written and by the great John Douglas of all people. And, and he was one of my training agents at Quantico going through the 12 week profiling school, he retires within two weeks. I'm sent to the Unabom task force. It wasn't like he directly passed the torch to me, but indirectly he did. And I'm looking at everything he wrote over the years and he did a darn good job. And his, his um, profiles were uh, advancing and improving and certainly changing over the years as more evidence became available. But he didn't have the benefit of the manifesto or even some of the late, uh, some of the spring letters, spring of 95 letters, the Unabomber was writing to the New York Times. So I kicked in at that point, revised the profile a bit, realizing profiles are meant to change. They're, they're not meant to be static. They, they can be altered down the line. And that was a good lesson for me therein. As new evidence becomes available, you can go back and change. And it's, it's okay. It's not, like, it's not like Douglas made mistakes. He only had so much evidence to go on. And he used every single bit of it in his early profiles in terms of age, in terms of the geographic origins of the Unabomber and, and other uh, factors relating to that. We then, of course, had the advantage of multiple letters leading up to the manifesto's release and the manifesto itself to really dig into his, uh, the Unabomber's mind and his soul, his motivations, his ideology, all those type things. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after these messages. One of the most frequent questions we're asked here at Mind Over Murder is, how can I help? Thanks to Othram, a leading forensic DNA testing lab for law enforcement, you can get involved and help solve real cases. If you have tested at a consumer genetics company, you can contribute your data to dnasolves.com. The process is easy and confidential. Just two simple steps. Your DNA might be the missing piece that helps solve the identity of an unknown person. Then Mind Over Murder will highlight cases Othram is working on to seek your crowdfunding support for DNA testing to help solve these cold cases. Upload your DNA profile to dnasolves.com. It's easy, free, and confidential. Then join Mind Over Murder as we help families find answers with Othram and dnasolves.com. Welcome back to Mind Over Murder. So I did learn that uh, a profile done on uh, day 100 of a case could be modified or altered on day 200 of a case. Mm -hmm. And I I was always open-minded. It doesn't mean you made a mistake early on. You only had so much evidence to go on. But if other crimes are committed after day 100, I'm just picking this number out, and other evidence left behind, other behavioral indicators, there's absolutely nothing wrong with modifying the profile from there. And that's certainly what I did in the next six months or so, uh, being newly assigned to the UTF, and quite frankly, being a brand new profiler, I wasn't even thinking of the word linguistics yet. But as the miniseries suggested, it's in my book, and we may have talked before, as soon as I got out to the UTF, I told the bosses, hey, what's this dad at his eye, this acrostic that goes down the second letter, the, the first letters of each paragraph? And, you know, dad at his eye, well, we never saw that before. I said, well, yeah, I saw it on the flight out. Well, that letter's 10 years old. Hey, you guys see this before? Uh, no. 
All right, Fitz, you're in charge of all the documents. And like, I'm gulping, I am. Because uh, I noticed I'm a profiler, something. I'm a seasoned investigator. But sure, I'll work with the documents. I figure if someone's writing this much, there's going to be clues to who he is in there and, yeah. um, and what he is. And is it his educational level, his socioeconomic level, his philosophy, his ideology, all those type things. And sure enough, uh, we were right. And we also had enough idiosyncratic features of his writing style itself that we'd said someone's going to recognize this type of uh, the style of writing, the content, the context, the punctuation, all those type of stylistic features uh, contained therein with, uh, you know, uh, 35,000 words. It's inevitable. We thought it'd be a teacher or professor, perhaps maybe even a student. If this guy was a, um, a, a, an academic, which nobody was really sure about that, but certainly a high school teacher, something like that. And sure enough, it was his brother that ultimately saw it. Well, his, his sister-in-law saw it, who told her husband, Kaczynski's brother, David. He then read it, took a few more months, and uh, luckily he was identified. He turned the documents over. And if you've uh, read my book, watched the miniseries, or even my audio book, you'll know how that all plays out. Fitz, the letters that you referenced that Kaczynski wrote to the New York Times, was he, in those letters, outing himself as the Unabomber, or was he writing about other issues as a concerned citizen? Yeah, uh, good question. He he made sure that each of his devices had the letters FC on the bottom. Bombers are very specific about their their tradecraft and their uh, their workmanship, and they don't want anyone else taking credit for it. So every one of his devices, at least after the first or second, had the letters FC in the bottom. Of course, the uh, the the manifesto was industrial society and its future by FC. But on the letters to the New York Times starting in 93, he also included a a nine-digit number, which looked just like a social security number. Mm -hmm. And um, so he wanted to make sure that they knew it was always him who sent these letters in, not an imposter. So a long-winded answer to your question, Bill. But yes, in fact, he was identifying himself. You know, the FBI calls us Unabomber. Interesting plural pronouns. Yeah, us. Our group, yeah. us, we, but we were sure. Douglas was sure initially, and I picked right up with that, that there was one person involved in this and no more. But uh, no, it was, he wasn't pretending to be anyone else or some sort of outsider as a, you know, a speaking for this Unabomber person. This was the bomber. Mm-hmm. This is why I'm doing it. To this day, I've been asked, you know, dozens of times, if he never wrote any letters or a manifesto, would he have ever been caught? And I said, you know what, unless he got careless and left the fingerprint somewhere or DNA, you know, hair and fiber that could somehow be identified, it's very likely he wouldn't. But once he put the writings out there, that really opened uh, the evidence door for us. And it really uh, it really allowed us to better understand what he's all about, probe more into his mindset and his uh, his philosophies of life. And also uh, just pick up on these stylistic features of his of his writing. And uh, hopefully someone would identify it. And of course, David eventually did. So I am a little curious when you are saying that it's possible he never would have been caught. Is it because he was just that good or because he just got that lucky? Well, luck is uh, opportunity plus preparation. I always, uh, whether it's your own luck or something else, you have to have been prepared for it and be, you know, kind of at the right place at the right time. So if you're going to commit a series of crimes and you're willing to live in a cabin by yourself with all interaction to the outside world cut off, and not just for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, but for several decades, Mm -hmm. and you're willing to travel long distance by cash and mail things and wear gloves and you wear gloves the whole time while you're constructing these devices, I would say it's a very good possibility you are going to get away with this for a long time. I'm not saying anything that's going to encourage any type of future you know, killer here. I mean, you, you have to really be willing to basically put your entire life on hold to be successful at a series of crimes like this. And especially when you figure in these crimes were not profit motivated. They were not greed motivated. There was an alleged philosophy or ideology behind them. You know, industrial society is bad. We should live in uh, agrarian groups of no more than 30 people, tribes. Uh, But I don't don't know how much he really believed of that. It's what he states. There's no sexual component, no overt sexual component to the crime or crimes. Uh, Psychologists could argue, was there some sort of a 
you know, a sexual need being fulfilled here, whatever, or anger, frustration, because he here's a straight guy that never had a relationship with anyone, much less a woman. He wrote about that uh, prolifically in terms of how he's he's frustrated. He never did find a woman who would, uh, you know, want any parts of him in so many words. So without getting too psychological here in terms of what the bombs represented uh, from a sexual perspective. But the bottom line is he weren't sexual assaults. He wasn't breaking into homes to 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 rape and accost women in that regard. So if you're willing to sac, you know, um, uh, filter all of your life's ambitions, wants, and uh, and uh, you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, put those all aside uh, to commit a series of crimes. That's that's preparation and that's opportunity. It's more than just luck. So uh, he was really on a track to having a perfect you know crime record, so to speak where he could have been getting away with it to this day. Nowadays, with cameras everywhere and more advances in the postal system, things like that, he very likely may have been uh, identified somehow, some other way, through the technology which he despised. But uh, no, he, he put everything on the line, in effect, to be successful at these crimes. And, uh, and for him, uh, it worked for 17 years. But his writings gave him away. It'll happen every time. It takes an incredible level of commitment on his part to put that much effort into this thing. And as you were saying, Fitz, it's not like, you know, we had the situation with the uh, gas pipeline just recently and, you know, there, but there's a profit motive and they were, they wanted $5 million after committing their crime. They were looking for payment here. He's not looking for any of those things. Right. And um, I suppose it's easier nowadays with Bitcoins and other sorts of currency that have been created, digital sort of, or sort of currency. But yeah, in the old, that's why kidnappings are not successful in this country. Kidnappings for, for profit, because picking up the money is always the most difficult part. Right. Uh, and um, even if it goes to some off island, you know, account somewhere that can still be traced a little bit different nowadays with Bitcoins and all that. Uh, but that was never part of his, pro- uh, his, uh, his motive. There was no profit margin uh, involved for him. It was strictly killing these representational targets that bothered him for whatever reason, in whatever way, and he would choose them from the who's who. He would read articles about them in certain uh, you know, national magazines or newspapers, and then um, look them up on who's who, that big thick book every library has one or two volumes of, and that's how he got their addresses, put them in the mail, and, and send them off. And he even altered his style because in 1987, that's when the famous and iconic composite sketch of his was seen. And that's when he, that was the last time he ever placed a device. After that, he always mailed them from a box somewhere. So he altered his modus operandi because he was almost caught. He also took six years off to uh, perfect his skill set in that regard. And he moved on from there. So um, the, the odds are, uh, to go back to the very beginning of this question, he uh, and, and Kristen, you're this question you asked me for the audio book as well as, as today here is uh, he very well, uh, if he didn't do the writing and he maintained his steadfast compunction of being very evidence conscious, he could still be getting away with these, uh, these devices today if he played his cards very carefully and conscious of cameras and technology and all the things that he hated in real life. He could still be doing it today. Granted, you had a ton of material to work with for the Unabomber. You had the manifesto, you had all sorts of letters, but when you have a much smaller uh, sample, I suppose, like say a one page letter or a ransom note or something like that, how do you glean information out of a very small amount of text as opposed to a large amount of text? Like, how does that work? Well, in linguistics, uh, you know, size can matter. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't say it does matter. It can matter. <laughs> and that, um, you know, the more text available, generally the better to make some sort of a either comparison between unknown uh, author with known author, or just to look at it and attempt to come up with a demographic or linguistic profile. So, of course, it was a treasure trove with uh, the Unabomber and everything he wrote. And then, of course, everything that his mother and brother eventually turned into us for uh comparison's sake. And we go into all that in my book and as well as uh, the audio book. But no, it's, it, it, it really doesn't, I, I can have a solid page where somebody has a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, a lot of emotion, and depending on the handwritten or, or, or keyboarded, computer generated, whatever, 
the advantage that linguists have in determining indicators of just who is the author is that there's a lot of, um, there's always that emotion and anger involved. And someone's going to take the time to threaten someone, to scare someone, to make some kind of a demand. There's going to be, they're, they're not always the cool-headed logicians, to, uh, to quote Kaczynski in, uh, in, uh, in one of his writings. But uh, they're, they're not always cool and calm and collected. They're, they're angry. They're upset. And that's the best way to capture the vernacular of someone. There's a well-known sociolinguist named Bill LaBeouf. He did a lot of early work in, in New England and Philadelphia and other places looking at dialect features in New York City. And he came up with, uh, when he was trying to interview people, they would get nervous and he'd put a microphone in their face and they wouldn't, and he wasn't really capturing their true, their true voice. Mm-hmm. And, and an idea he came up with is called the danger of death scenario. And he would come up to them, identify who he is. He wouldn't say exactly what he's studying. He wouldn't say, I'm studying language, but he would say, um, I'm just looking for some, you know, like a five minute conversation with you. Can you tell me about a time when you've come close to death? And they kind of stop for a minute and, oh, well, uh, okay. And maybe someone's been lucky and that's never happened. And I guess you would be lucky if that's never happened. Mm -hmm. But with other people, they can think of whatever the incident may be. And if they're willing to talk to then Bill LaBeouf about it, he, he found that they got emotional in telling the story. They were digging deep into their background, into a very serious moment in their life. And they would, in fact, resort to their vernacular language. And, and that would be the most telling. And he's measuring vowels and consonant clusters, things like that. He wasn't looking to solve crimes, whatever. But how, you know, I say, I grew up in Philly saying water. Other people in other parts of the country say water. In the South, you say yaw. In, in Philly, yeah. you say use. So that's what the kind of stuff he was looking for to differentiate certain regions of the country and their dialects. So that having been said, I learned early on in my profiling days and my threat assessment days in the FBI that if someone's going to take the time to write a nasty letter to someone, they're angry. They're emotional. They're pissed off, if I can use that language. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> thank you for the permission. But, uh, but they, and, and they, and they want to make their points across, get their points across. There's an old saying that um, revenge is a dish best served cold. Right. I didn't think about that the first time I heard that. Well, it doesn't make any sense. But actually, it does. The advantage that we have as forensic linguists is most people don't do that. They'll sit down at the keyboard. They'll sit down. I mean, maybe it could be a, a voicemail. Someone leaves, you know, right. uh, and, and they'll get right into the threat and something will happen. Sometimes it may take a few weeks or so. They're, they're, it's fomenting within them and it's building. It's building. But, but the, the anger and frustration is still there. They sit down at the keyboard. They put it together and they just send that thing off. And that's when we have an advantage over uh, other people in terms of looking at a writing style, because with that, with that emotionality brings the, the most deep-rooted, identifiable aspects of their dialect features, spoken or written. And, and that's what we try to capture as forensic linguists, even in one page. And that was your original question, Kristen. You know, hundreds of pages with the Unabomber. Sometimes I have one or two pages in a case I'm working, you know, nowadays, uh, as a consultant in, in this field, and sometimes I'll say, "Look, I, I can't do anything with this. You, you need to get me. I you need to get me more documents of some sort." Right. And sometimes the bad guy or bad woman, whoever, only sends one fifty-word email or something, and that's it. And there's not a whole lot I can do with that. Although there are occasions when there is an idiosyncratic feature, even within those fifty words, that I rarely use the term "unique" because that literally means one of a kind. But I will say highly distinctive highly unusual, you know, double, you know, N dashes, double M dashes, whatever. And and that's really for comparison purposes. But for trying to determine an anonymous communication, and is this a man? Is it a woman? Older, younger, uh, native English speaker, socioeconomic background, educational background, race, ethnicity. These are all factors that with enough material or with enough indicators, sometimes even within 50 words or so, and that would kind of be a rarity, but but there have been some that happen in that regard, in, a, in my experience. These identifiable features can be gleaned, and a profile or a, a linguistic or demographic profile can be put together of an individual, an anonymous author. And that is then a clue that you give to the police, the, the CEO of the company, you know, whoever is the, reporting this. 
And that's then an investigative clue to look for further suspects. Now, that information would not be testifiable in court. And I have no problem with that. It, it, it's, just, it's a profile. Profiling is not testifiable. But then they get wind up with other suspects and they can then build, we can then build the case from there. And perhaps I can make the case then comparing that even 50 word document to some known emails from that person in a company. And so oh, here's the same feature over and over. Only this employee has it. I think this is a, this, you know, 50 plus year old woman, you know, is, is, is your author and they can, uh, they interview her. Perhaps she confesses and many cases work that way for me. And we just start with like that 50, 100 words of some kind of a threat anything. It may not even be a crime. There's this, uh, I think it's glassdoor.com. It's a website. People go on and write about their companies. Oh, many yeah. Many times good things, many times bad things. Sometimes CEOs and presidents of companies see these things. And of course, you know, we have the First Amendment. You're allowed to do mostly those things, but they still want to know who's, you know, who may be insulting their brand or, or, or sometimes putting information out there that's, that's inappropriate. And I may get hired and try to figure it out in that regard. So, Long story short here, I probably made it long, but like, you know, 50 to 100 words, there can be information gleaned from that, but it's usually better with additional writings to go along uh, with that to best create the profile of the unknown author. I'm starting to regret those less than stellar reviews I left about the companies I used to work for. (laughs) Well, uh, if you didn't break any laws and... um, you didn't uh, tell any libelous or scandalous type things about the CEO. You should be okay. Okay. So management sucks is probably okay. <laughs> <laughs> could f- could learn a few lessons about how to treat employees better. Things like that. Well, and, and where it gets interesting in these types of cases is it's, it's an old secret. I, I know what happens on Twitter. There's people will have a Twitter name or they'll have a, uh, um, glass, glass, what's it? Glass ceiling. What did I just call it? Glass, glass door. door. Yeah, and but they'll create other names. Yeah, and mm-hmm. so Joe Smith. Oh, this company sucks. Then Mary, you know, Jones. Hey, I agree with you, Joe Smith. But I've been asked sometimes, <laughs> are these the same? The people? same people. And they are right, mm-hmm. and they are, and they love. And I think this happens on Twitter a lot. You know, all these people that are so mouthy. And, hey, you're right, Joe. I agree 100. Mm-hmm. percent You know, and uh, <laughs> it's it's actually the same person with just a different name. Which you're not supposed to do that on certain social media accounts, if any, but they do it. So, so that's another, uh, another aspect I'm asked sometimes, hey, we have these six different characters over a three-week period, all saying these similar type things. And, you know, coincidentally, these things did happen in the office that day. This happened within an hour of this, you know, posting. And so is it a, a former employee? Is it a current employee? Is a current employee giving this information to a former employee? And like I said, it gets tricky sometimes. And I'm very careful I don't just shoot from the hip and, uh, you know, and I, I've probably upset attorneys and CEOs and said, look, the evidence isn't here to give you the answer that you want. And uh, there's you know, no, no amount you can pay me or anything like that to tell you that, you know, this is what you want to get. That's why I've been so successful in my career, because as many cases I accept, I may turn down twice and saying, look, you don't have enough documents here, or this is just, it's just too generic. And there's no evidence that I can glean from this. Let me know in the future. If more comes forward and we can readdress it, sometimes it does happen. In many cases, it doesn't. So Fitz, if our listeners do want to find the Fitz files or buy any of your books, where should they go? The best place where it's all put together is my website, jamesrfitzgerald.com. And I really just had it, uh, I just had it redone. And uh, there's a tab for the Fitz files. And even if you don't listen to uh, the Fitz files, uh, every episode is demarcated and there's a, the scripts are put in there from the show, uh, pictures of me with different actors, pictures of me in the real Unabomber cabin, pictures of me in the TV created Unabomber cabin. And it's also, I can take you right to the link of how to get the books. I do send signed copies around the U.S., and I have a cool little poster I put up. I've designed for uh, for people too, and I think Kristen has one. Yes, she I have does. it right here. I'm looking at it on video, <laughs> and uh, you too can have your own, folks. Wow, if you, uh, snazzy! Yeah, if you if you buy one of the books, or uh, we're going to come up with some kind of a uh, a promotion for the audio book too, where some uh, some signed posters will be given away. But JamesRFitzgerald.com basically answers all your questions, and you should be good to go. Exciting. This is going to be highly motivating. I think people are going to want this great stuff. 
Well, especially with Kristen in it. I mean, you can't go wrong. Skip <laughs> right to episode eight about the fourth question in, and there's our Kristen asking a And she's mentioned question. By, by name. She is absolutely even her last name. Well. And uh, and Mind Over Murder is referenced. Now, I already answered the question here, kind of, but I held back a little bit today. You have There's to. more to the, uh, to the <laughs> other answer on the uh, audio book. You can't put it all out on the table like for free like this. Well, that's true, but we can't tell you how much we appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. And you're more than welcome. Well, Fitz, thank you so much for joining us. We always love having you on the podcast, and we hope you'll come back a second time. Or actually, what is it now, a fourth time? I mean, yeah, I just to hold the yeah. record here. Third or fourth time for me. Yeah. I, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, keep me in mind. There's a lot of things we can talk again. And I'll, I'll end this with you. I did answer some of your Unibom questions, but if you listen to the very end of my audio book, I've announced in a few months I am retiring from all things Unibom. Okay. So I am talking about the Fitz files. You asked some legitimate questions, tying it into linguistics and whatever. But uh, I figured 25 years, uh, what I'm telling people now is if you don't find the answer in my book, my, my paper book, if you don't find, that's a journey to the center of the mind, book three. If you don't find it in the miniseries, if you don't find it in the Fitz Files Manhunt Unabomber, you may want to consider writing a letter to Ted Kaczynski while he's still alive. <laughs> because uh, it's been answered on my end, everything I could from the FBI, UTF end. And, uh, and there's other books out there too, of course. But I tried to cover all of it and get what's right and wrong in the miniseries out there and uh, and everything else in the book. So so yeah, I have a few more months of talking Unabom stuff. Then it's moving on to other chapters of my life. And book four, of a journey to the center of the mind is being worked on as we speak and it will be out in the next year. I'll just leave it at that. Fitz, thank you so much for joining us. We love having you aboard. Kristen, thank you, Bill, you too. And both you guys stay well. Mind over murder is a production of absolute zero and another dog productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder. Thank you.